A seven-month journey by NASA's new rover comes to a thrilling climax later. The uh, rover will attempt to land on Mars. Uh, the most intense part of the landing is the seven minutes uh, that come after Perseverance hits the Martian atmosphere and has to slow down to land. NASA describes those moments as seven minutes of terror. Ten minutes to touchdown. The Perseverance rover must separate from the spacecraft that has brought it to Mars. Next, it must position itself to enter the Martian atmosphere, the friction of which will heat up its thermal shield to temperatures as high as 1300 degrees Celsius. While the Mars rover inside the shield will only reach room temperature. When Perseverance's speed reaches 1600 kilometers per hour, its parachute will deploy. The new range trigger technology will improve the spacecraft's ability to hit a landing target. 20 seconds later, the heat shield will detach from the entry capsule. Allowing the rover to find a safe landing site. At about 2,100 meters or 7,000 feet above Mars' surface, Perseverance will separate from its parachute and ignite its jetpack's eight engines, further slowing the research laboratory on wheels. The sky crane maneuver will lower the rover down to the surface on nylon tethers. Next, Perseverance must reposition its legs and wheels. Right after touchdown, it must detach from the tethers. Mission Control will only find out whether the Mars rover landed successfully 11 minutes after the fact, and whether it will be able to explore Jezero Crater. Its floor was home to an ancient lake delta system about four billion years ago, which left a layer of sediment a promising site in the hunt for microscopic fossils. The United Arab Emirates will also explore Mars. Its space probe, HOPE, entered the red planet's orbit on February 9th and is scheduled to start work this summer. HOPE will examine the Martian atmosphere for two years observing weather and seasonal changes. The Chinese have big plans for their first Mars mission. They also want to land a spacecraft, something only the Americans have so far succeeded in doing. China's Tianwen-1 probe has been orbiting the red planet since February 10th. It will reach the surface with a landing device and research vehicle in May, and send data gathered on Mars back to Earth. Next, the probe will examine the types of minerals on Mars and make maps of resources, such as ore deposits. Planetary researchers are looking forward to all the new data. Sounds like it's getting quite crowded up there. Let's take a closer look at this uh, race to Mars with uh, Caitlin Johnson. She's Deputy Director and Fellow of the Aerospace Security Project at the Center for Strategic and International Studies in Washington, D.C. Welcome to uh, DW. Uh, is there more to these national missions than just science? Uh, for the Mars program, science is definitely the priority. And, and luckily, in the international community, um, the science missions are extremely collaborative. And so I think we're all hoping to see a lot of data sharing and information gathering from the Mars missions, which you know, could in, uh, enable future uh, you know, crewed missions sending humans to Mars. Right. Uh, China is uh, due to land on Mars soon as well. What sets their space program apart from, say, NASA's? Um, obviously, NASA has um, a long history of landing uh, rovers on Mars. This is the fifth, um, as well as several other Martian um, experiments and spacecraft that have been sent. Um, this is China's first 
Um, they are having kind of a two-part mission. The first is to monitor the atmosphere, very similar to the UAE's HOPE mission. Um, but the second and, and uh, more technically complicated is landing um, a system on Mars, which uh, will happen this summer, and then sending the first data back to China. Um, from a Chinese system. They've had great success on the moon recently as well. And so this is just one more step in growing their civil space program. And, and does that data get shared as well, the, the, the Chinese data? It does. Uh, there are some complications, at least between the United States and China. There is a law in the United States that um, restricts cooperation between NASA and the Chinese space program. Um, but China does share and distribute that data with other scientists around the world. Um, and there is a little bit of collaboration between NASA and, and China and has been in, with their moon missions. And hopefully we can use uh, these new science missions to just keep growing that relationship and cooperation right. between the two nations. So uh, who runs Mars? I know it's, an, uh, it's a weird question, but if, say, China or the US discovers valuable minerals up there and decide they want to exploit them, does anyone else get a say, or does it become like the, sort of, like the Wild West? Whoever's got the biggest guns gets to keep as much as they can carry. It's a little bit Wild West. There is a, um, a treaty from the United Nations in 1967 called the Outer Space Treaty, which kind of lets, it's kind of finders keepers. Um, so if you find materials on a celestial body, you can keep it, um, send it back to your, you know, your home nation to study. Um, but other than that, it's pretty vague. And it's something that I know NASA is working on, um, de developing further uh, regulations or international consensus around um, you know, what the process might be like for future missions. Really quite interesting, the idea of finders keepers having made it onto the international statute book. Because it's not just governments, is it? Private companies are, are looking to Mars as well, like Elon Musk's SpaceX. So how are they likely to affect these exploration efforts? I think it adds um, a, a lot of complexity to an already complex uh, issue. Uh, Frankly, the legislation for the space community and for actions in outer space is pretty vague and pretty outdated. Um, it was developed in, mostly in the 60s, and a lot of it is tied to, to nuclear regulations. But as we have these commercial companies looking to the moon and to Mars for both human exploration, but also their own commercial purposes, I think we really need to think hard as an international community of what will best protect those planets um, and, and preserve, you know, the, the integrity of their, of, of the planet itself. Um, so we don't just have a bunch of people out there mining Mars. Um, however, you know, that could, that they could swing and that could be the case. Um, something for the lawyers to figure out. All right. Good talking to you. Thank you so much for joining us. Caitlin Johnson of the Center for Strategic and International Studies.